everyone, hope you're well today. Uh, welcome back to my workshop for the first video for some time now. I think it's probably over a year since I've done one of these things. The last one was on the Tamiya Messerschmitt 109G that I did last year. And I've been asked on a few occasions throughout the last 12 months of shows and that kind of thing to have a go at doing another one of these things. And time really hasn't been on my side, but couldn't really get away from it. Um, this weekend, and and so um, whilst we were at Sky Model World for the for the, the annual showcase at Telford, a few people asked me if I was going to do another one, and I thought, well, why not? Give it a, give it a go, and and see what we can kind of come up with. Part of the reason for for deciding to do a video uh, is the release, imminent release in the UK of Tamir's new Spitfire Mark One. So I got hold of a sample of one of those um, at the show and I thought I'd give it a look, show you what I think um, and all of that kind of nonsense and, and, uh, and let you make your own mind as to whether you think it's worth buying or ignoring or whatever you choose to do really. Um, before I get on to doing um, the, the, the assessment of the new kit, I thought I'd round up a few other things um, before we get on to, on to all of that. And um, I just kind of had a little bit of chat about the show and a chat about my thoughts on Scale Model World and, um, and some other bits and pieces that have happened over the last 12 months since, since you saw my nonsense from this room. First, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody that's taken the time to um, not only support what I've done and what my team have done with Model Airplane International. Um, I'd also like you to, I'd like to thank you as well for, for supporting me personally with, with some other projects that I've done as a sideline to that. I think everybody that's worked alongside me over the last two, three years um, has worked extremely hard, sometimes under quite trying circumstances. And I would like to publicly thank those people who've been alongside me, helped me out and made my life easier than perhaps it could have been um, um, for um, with bills and with ancillary bits and pieces, helping out with photographs uh, and, and just general support really. I know that um, that Doolittle, who published Model Airplane International, feel exactly the same way. And they maybe don't get the opportunity to thank people in such a public way as I can. So I'm really thanking everybody for doing that. You all know who you are, so I don't need to name you. Um, and I'm, I'm, it would probably be remiss of me to do so at the expense of others who I forget. Um, so I'm not going to do that. But you do know who you are, and um, thank you very much for doing that. It, it really is very much appreciated. Along similar lines, again, thank um, those people that have helped out with the four books that I've that I've published this year. They've been really small projects, just something that allows me to control what I do, how I present it, some of the work that I that I do. It's not a grandiose idea, it's not something that I wanted to take the world over with. It's just something that I can do in my spare time and, and, and hopefully people can enjoy. The latest of those books is this one, which I know a lot of you will already have seen. This is my book on the Tamiya F-14 Tomcat. It's, um, it's kind of a guide book rather than a nuts and bolts uh, look at, at what I still consider to be the greatest 48th kit ever released. I, two years ago I wrote, a, I, I wrote a, um, uh, an article for Tamiya Magazine International on, on a pre-release um, version of, of the F-14A and following that did a number of videos that I'm sure that, or I, I hope, that a number of you have already seen, explaining exactly why I felt the way that I did about that kit. Two years later, another version has been released, the Delta version, and that's allowed me to revisit the kit and, uh, and also allowed me to, to create this book. 
The book itself, for those who haven't seen this, includes three distinct features. It includes a from-the-box build of the F14A. That just shows an overview of how the kit goes together, how you can assemble it in a modular way, and how it kind of all comes together at the end. The second article in here is another F14A, but that one is, is reworked, redetailed. It's got a brass in cockpit, it's got brass in jet pipes, replacement wheels, it's also got a set of furball decals, it's got a different approach to the colour scheme, it's got a different approach to the, the paints used. And then the third project within this book is on the F14D, the bomb cast that Tamir released earlier on this year, in the summer of this year. And that's a full-blown painting exercise that explains my approach to the TPS scheme that that aircraft was finished in. I've done a Grim Reapers one with black tails, and it's my approach to um, to 164, which is the which is the version that's offered in the kit alongside Bounty Hunters aircraft and a couple of others that have slipped my mind at the moment. So so thank you all for for taking time to to take a look at this. Like I say, it, it's a small project. It's very limited edition. I, I, I've done a very small print run. There are some left if people are interested in this book and. This would be a wasted opportunity if I didn't say, check out my blog. You can see, I'll put a link to the book in the blog and you, you can kind of see it. There are a handful left of these. So if anybody is interested in seeing seeing this book and you'd kind of like to see what I've done and how I've approached, how I've approached this, then please, please take a look. Um, it won't be for everybody, um, I guess. It's, um, I, I'm sure that the other people who've approached this kit would approach the book in a different way. That's great. Um, so, so that's that. Okay, um, Scale Model World. Scale Model World was held this weekend at Telford. Um, thousands of people turned up to what is still, I guess, the biggest two-day modelling event in the world. It never ceases to amaze me how huge this thing is and, and how much it's grown since its early days as the, the IPMS UK National Championships. It's a bookmark, really, for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm. I tend to approach SMW as the end of my working year and the beginning of a new one. So everything funnels down to that point, and then I do what I need to do at the show, and then on the Monday after the show, I, I sort of recenter myself and then decide what I'm going to do for the next twelve months leading up to that event. So from a personal point of view, it's an extremely important event for me. It, it's, it always has been, um, ever since I started going to Stoney in Warwickshire in the early 80s. I've been to every single one since then, and it's always had the same importance from, from competition all the way through to my professional responsibilities with Military and Scale magazine, and then latterly as a model maker for Doolittle, and now as an editor for Doolittle. They all kind of stack up. So there. This year's event was was really, I think, going to be remembered for four things. I've written about this in my blog. I think it's going to remember, be remembered predominantly for four kits that people got um, the chance to have a really good look at for the first time. Two Lancasters, both in 30 second scale. Um, the, the Hong Kong Hobbies Lancaster was one that had already been kind of pre-released. Then there was the Winglet Wings version, which had been announced earlier on this year, but nobody had seen in the flesh. Then the Airfix 24 scale Hellcat, which was announced on the Saturday of the show. And to some fanfare, it has to be said, I thought it was very cool. And finally, Winglet Wings announcement on the Sunday of the show, that they were going to be producing a 30-second scale 0400 bomber. Now, the 0400 is, to me, the highlight of the event. It, it, it absolutely stole the show. Couldn't really believe what I, was, what I was seeing in front of me, and it took me a while to process the information. It's massive to start with. The Lancaster is a huge aeroplane. It's a huge model. Um, it has a 104-feet wingspan, in reality. The 0400 has a 102 foot wingspan. The difference being it has two sets of wings and the fuselage just seems to be slightly longer. And although it's it's kind of in, in, in bulk, it's not as big. 
the sheer presence of this thing when it stood on its undercarriage was just extraordinary. And the fact that it's it's detailed the way that it is and allows you to fold the wings, it, it really was a gobsmacking moment. Having seen the Felix Stone and seen the way that that worked, that Felix Stone was, was quite something when it arrived in its suitcase-sized box. I think this thing is going to have every, every bit as much impact. The two Lancasters are, again, I guess, going to be seen as showcase releases. Winglet Wings Lancaster is not due out again, uh, not due for its full debut on the model shop shelves until the end of next year. Um, speaking to Richard Alexander and David Johnson on the, their on their stand, they kind of nervously laughed and said, "Yeah, we think it's going to be next this time next year. May well be a little bit later." Although the model looked complete on the stand and you could see everything that was on there, you could see all the detail and you could see the way that they'd approached the, the, the surface finish with all of the rippling panels. It was an incomplete model in the sense that the surface detail, though extraordinary to look at, is only half finished. And what they're now planning to do is to rivet it as well. As well. So you've got all the rippling that runs along the surface of the wings and the fuselage, and then in between those ripples, they're gonna rivet. They had a piece of plastic that was about the size of a postage stamp sat on the, on the stand. And on the surface of that piece of plastic was, was the depiction of how they're going to do the rivets on this model as raised rivets, not incised rivets, raised features. And you could run your finger across the top of it and it gave this sort of very delicate impression of the, these rivet lines. It was, um, yeah, extraordinary. Um, I, I spoke to a number of people about this model, some quite well-known guys in, in the sort of the large-scale um, arena, and a conversation centred around just how, not how you're going to build it, um, but how, how you would paint this model to make it look realistic in that scale, because there's no fudging it. It's so big, and there's so many surface features anything other than a, an accurate realisation of how one of these bombers would have looked during the Second World War, I think would make it look bizarre. It, it, it's, I'm only beginning to start to think about how I would paint, how I would paint it and how I would get the levels of, of colour and patina and the weathering and all of those kind of things onto the surface of this thing. It's extraordinary. The second Lancaster is Hong Kong Hobbies Lancaster. That it's, this thing has been sort of on the go for a few years now. People have seen odd bits and pieces of it. I spoke to the, I think he's the, uh, he must be the owner of Hong Kong Hobbies and a couple of his, the members of his team about the kit. Their kit is approached in a very different way to the Wing That Wings kit. It's, it's simplified to make it easier for average modelers to build. That means that, that people who've got um, a number of other kits under their belt will be able to approach theirs and find little in it that really kind of trips them up. Other than the size, this thing is this wide when it's sat on your, uh, on your desk. So although it's kind of huge, I think the way that they've molded certain parts and the way that they've broken it down will make it easier to put together. I think the, the, the Great Wall, uh, sorry, the Wing That Wings kit, Seems to have Great Wall Hobby stuck in my brain at the moment for some reason. The Wing That Wings kit has a thousand plus parts. I'm not sure that the that the Hong Kong Hobbies version uh, approaches that. I'm sure that the, the roster of parts is still high, but I don't think it approaches that. Now, the, the Hong Kong Hobbies kit is still very impressive. I have to say, I, I had a, a quite a good look at it. It differs in, in, in the sense that, unlike Wing That Wing's version, which is only detailed around the cockpit area and then around the crew access door, three quarters of the way down the fuselage, the centre section is actually empty. They've, they've approached it in that way intentionally. HK's version isn't, it's detailed all the way along, so you will get all of that kind of detail in there. From what I could see, although I probably need to check into this a little bit further, HK's version includes four engines. 
wing nuts will only include one engine, but you will be able to buy the other three as separate kits, should you wish to show off more than one. So that that's how they differ. Price points, I think, will, they will be similar. I don't think there'll be a great deal of difference between the two. In terms of surface finish, HK's is definitely of the moment in terms of the way they've approached it in, the, in that it's smooth with very finely engraved panel lines and rivets running around them. They had theirs built up and they'd washed over the surface of the model with, with ink or, or some form of paint to show off the panel lines and they did look really nice. They looked very impressive. It's, I think it's absolutely going to be a case of you pay your money and you take your choice with these two kits. There was some murmurings that here we go again, we've got another duplication across the, across the industry and, and why have we got two 30 second scale Lancasters, blah, blah, blah. I think it should be pointed out here that Wingnut's kit's been in development for nine years and they've been working in absolute secrecy on this model for that entire time. My feeling on that then is that nobody could have known that they were working on that and Hong Kong Hobbies version has been in development nowhere near as long. I think it's just serendipity that the two have appeared at the same time that they've, they're going to hit the market within 12, 18 months of each other. But you are going to get the choice and I think people will choose one or the other unless they've got big houses and big budgets and would like both. Don't know. I think um, Model Airplane International is going to have a look at both of these kits. We're going to we're going to we're going to have one. T t uh, um, hopefully by the end of the year, HK is by, by the end of the year. That gives us next year to take a look at that, and then we'll have the second one into twenty twenty, um, and then we'll get a we'll get a look at that as well. The final um, announcement, I guess, was that Hellcat. That Hellcat came completely out of the blue. I have to say. Uh, I'm normally pretty good with these these kind of things, and I I couldn't couldn't have conceived that that kit was going to be released. It it, it it's it's sort of mind blowing when you see it. They've taken what happened with the Typhoon and they've run with it slightly. So they've taken those design ideas in terms of surface finish, again rippling overlapped panels, that kind of thing, and they've pushed it one step further. They've given the designer the leeway to to approach it in any way that he wants. Hellcat's a pretty agricultural looking aeroplane at the best of times, and they've recreated that pretty well from what I can see. The wings rip, all the rivet lines inside the wings look like they're all in place. So that'll add, a, add extra layers of possibility when it comes to finish and, and painting. From talking to the design team, it was actually a pretty close toss up between that and Corsair. This model's been in, in production now and in design for four years, but was shelled for a number of, uh, of years from what appears to be budgetary um, concerns and then was, was pulled out, um, I guess it would have been earlier on this year, I, I don't know for, for definite, to be released in May of next year. And part of the reason why the Corsair wasn't, from what I can gather, wasn't considered was that it was that four years ago when they decided they were going to do that was about the same time that Tamir released their 30 second scale kit the 1A and then the 1D and they closed the book on large scale Corsairs effectively I don't think that Airfix felt that they could do any more with it and I heard the the description of confusing the market that was how it appeared to them at that point uh, it would confuse the market to have two large-scale Corsairs being released at, at a similar kind of time. And they had an absolute avalanche of technical documents, drawings, and everything else that they needed sent over from the States for the Hellcat. And they had what they, they, they could use to create the kit that they wanted, and that's what they did. So they announced it with some fanfare on... Uh, on Saturday morning, as, uh, with a big banner that, that dropped down from the, the back of the hall and, and pulled the cover away. Um, and there was there was 
again, there have been murmurings on online about, about the kit. On the whole, it seems to have been well received, but there are definitely those that, that aren't happy to see an American subject being dealt with in this scale, in this way, rather than British subject, which kind of ignores the fact that it's got Royal Navy markings as part of the kit, and that puts it front and centre as a as a as a British subject, and that Airfix have already got a twenty four scale Mustang, which is an American subject as part of that line. So I, I for one, welcome it. I think it'll be a great kit. It'll, it'll be about one hundred and twenty pounds when it's released, which I think is probably about right for a kit of that size and complexity. It offers uh, an 85 part engine, it offers full cockpit, foldable wings, full, full undercarriage bays, the whole, the whole kind of nine yards really. And, and it's big, it's, it's, it's a sizable model. Even with its wings folded, it, it'll command some attention on, on your workbench and also on your, in your display case. So I think that's well worth, well worth taking a look at if large scale models are your thing. For those of um, who are questioning where the budget came from and is it going to impact on, on their small scale ranges, no it's not, they're still going to announce those in the new year. So there are other new kits that will be coming out from, from Airfix in, in the new year. Fear not, I'm sure that they've got a kind of all bases covered and they will be releasing 7748 um, over that period. And no, I don't know what they are. So, so I'm not even going to. Uh, I'm not even going to consider it here. So we'll kind of move on. Right, with all that nonsense out of the way and all of the all of the chitty chat about the about the show and and the thank yous out of the way. This thing. Uh, this is Tamiya's latest 148 scale kit, Spitfire Mark One. This replaces their previously released. 48 scale kit that has been in their catalogue now for well over 20 years, I would think. The earlier release is a slightly flawed example of this aircraft in 48 scale from Tamiya. It's not entirely accurate, fuselage is slightly off, so it, it gives it, a, from what I can gather, it gives it a slightly dumpy look. So Tamiya have, have done what they can to remedy that situation by bringing to market a brand new offering which will be released in this country from, from some point later in the year. There have been a number of these out there already, have already been built. There were plenty on the hobby company stand at the weekend. Also, Brett's done um, a very nice video review of his thoughts on, it, on this kit. So I'm sort of repeating the, the ground slightly, and, and, but hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll be okay with me, me taking a look at this. The kit itself is an early Mark I and offers both a pre-war aircraft as well as a, a wartime Spitfire Mark I. Limits colour scheme slightly to, to what we would imagine, but it's still a very nice kit of a very nice aeroplane at that, at that point. I would think that from what I can see in the box, a Mark V is likely to be coming at some point, but I have no concrete evidence about that other than what I can see in front of me. Over the last couple of years, Tamir has released a number of 48 scale kits which I've looked at. The, uh, the first was, was the Tomcat, which I mentioned earlier on, and then last year they released a Messerschmitt 109G. In conversations over the weekend, we sort of came to the conclusion that they that these three kits follow what appears to be two different approaches. And I have to thank my friend Jonathan Mott for, for, for using this kind of um, description and, and making me think about it. The Tamir Tomcat is essentially a linear kit. It's what it is. It's, it's a start to finish depiction of that aircraft made as simply as possible broken down as simply as possible to make the kit as easy and straightforward to build as possible. The 109G is a bit more of a let's show you what we can do kind of kit because it offered the open engine area where you could have it either open or closed, magnets allowing various things to be put into place uh, and 
So that was more of a technical exercise showing the modeling world what this company can produce. The Spitfire is back to a linear product. It's very simple in its approach, as you can probably imagine. Within the kit, are only, there are only three bags with three grey runners and then a fourth bag with a set of clear parts in it. So this kit is not going to tax anybody when it comes to, to construction, painting and applying the decals. You can see here, simple runner with, with just the, the wings sections on. This one here is comprises all of the details, tailplanes, cockpits, undercarriage parts. And then this one here is for the fuselage parts. Taking the fuselage to begin with, you'll notice in here that there are holes in the two fuselage halves. They're quite sizable, actually. What they're for is to allow inserts to go into each one of those, one of those holes, depending on whether or not you want to have the cockpit canopy, the sliding section, open or closed. Though they look essentially identical to each other, one of these sections is slightly pinched and that allows the glazed portion of the, the canopy. They offer you in the kit uh, a section of glazing that includes that sliding section with the rear section of glazing as one part, but they also offer those as two individual pieces that allow one to slide over the top of the other. And in so doing, and so offering two pieces that are smaller in, in size, that allows that to, to be depicted accurately. It is worth mentioning that they are identical to each other, so please be careful when it comes to, to if you build this kit, be careful to, to put each of these panels in the correct place. They're easy to, they're easy to mix up. Um, and that's something that you, that you should be kind of aware of as, as construction proceeds. I would imagine, although a conversation with, with um, my compatriots at TMMI, that the fit will be pretty much perfect, although I think there might be a slightly a slight leeway in there. So once again, be careful. Also on this runner is something that I haven't yet seen in the Spitfire kit, but is, is a tip of the hat by to me to their normal uh, clever designs, in that the undercarriage, the lowered undercarriage, isn't supplied as two separate parts. It's supplied as one piece that is essentially a bridge with two legs with a bridging section over the top that then fits into the underside of the wing and fixes the, the undercarriage legs at the, the correct angle and rake. I think that's a really very clever idea. It also adds a level of strength to it as well because you're not reliant on just simple peg and socket joints that go together. Although some of the, the other kits um, that this one will be competing with, they've got quite distinct and quite solid unions for the undercarriage legs. Sometimes that can be a bit wobbly and if you're not using super glue, it can take some time to set up correctly. This removes that, that possibility altogether. Questions have arisen online as to whether or not you have to glue those undercarriage legs in place before you paint the model. And the answer to that is no, you don't. You can paint the model and then the panels that fit over the openings on the underside of the, the, the main wing in here, this panel that fits in here, that can be added later on. And I'm pretty sure, though as you can see I haven't started construction on this thing yet, I'm pretty sure that the fit inside there will be so good that it, just a bead of liquid glue will be enough to hold, to hold it all in place. Looking further through the kit, it includes um, an astonishingly detailed cockpit for, a, for an off the, off, the, off the shelf kit. Brett in his video and various other places has described the kit cockpit as being amongst the best he's ever seen. Certainly one of the best from, from this particular brand and I have, a, I have a tendency to agree with that. It really is very good right from, right from the off. Digging further into 
here. The kit also includes a set of photo etch details on here. And as part of those photo etch details, you'll find seat straps included within this kit. So, for, as a first, I think, in 48th from, from these guys, this might be the first time that they've almost gone head-to-head -head as a profi pack. In fact, this is, this is a head-to-head -head with Edward's approach to their Spitfires. It's, it's to me as saying, well, we can do that as well. Because not only does this kit include all of the gray plastic parts that you need to build the airframe, the main aircraft, it also includes a set of photo etch details, these ones here, and they are comprehensive as well. It's not just a couple of parts, that's a proper threat of details. It also includes a set of canopy masks in here as well as, I'm going to have a look, I'm going to just grab this from here. Just going through the instructions, uh, the instructions show you how to use all of the, all of the photo etched details in here, but the kit Along with, with those photo etch parts, the kit also includes, as I've said before, those um, the canopy masks. And it also includes some self-adhesive details for raised panels that fit on the nose of the completed model. Very tiny pieces. They're, they sit in this, uh, they're in this bag in here. Those are added very late on for one of the versions and that version is the the pre-war version that's offered for number 65 squadron this is the pre-war version here for number 65 squadron and those panels fit on the side of the nose here and they're self-adhesive for anybody that's used uh, that's seen any of the other Tamiya 48 scale kits, such as the FW190A8 that they produced, that had self adhesive panels and they actually work really well. They are very sticky in place and once they're in, they, they won't come off once, you, once you've painted it. So, so this is essentially Tamiya giving their fans what they've asked for in terms of a complete package. This is a one-stop modeling experience. You don't go, need to go anywhere else unless you really want to. You don't need to go anywhere else to, to, to find what you need to create a really detailed model from this kit. I find I think that's a really good, really good thing. I'm really pleased to see that development um, from this from this brand and hopefully over the years to come we'll see that that develop further. Whether that starts to include colour etch and that kind of thing that Edouard do. I'd be surprised if that was the case. Those two companies have got pretty good relationships from what I can see in terms of of of, of Edouard supporting Tamir's releases in terms of additional parts that people can use. I think that that will probably remain as it is. But in terms of an actual package, this is as complete as you can get, and, and I think that's great. So along with the, the, the plastic parts that we've got in here, and those additions, <clears throat> the kit does include a decal sheet that offers three different versions, all of which are painted in standard dark earth, dark green, camouflage. The two of them have lighter undersurfaces, and then one has black and white on the surface. This one here, which adds a, which adds a sort of a nice level of contrast. In terms of actual subjects that the kit includes, the first one is a 610 Squadron aircraft from Battle of Britain, DWK, very famous release. Um, rather very famous aircraft. This is pretty well photographed and you can get plenty of information on that. The other one is FZL, which is the pre-war one that I mentioned. Um, this is dated from 1939. 
and is a 65 squadron aircraft. Although this one's kind of bland, there's not really a lot on it, and it, it bears very small serial numbers. I rather like this one, and the reason why I like this one is it because it includes the red and blue roundels on, on the fuselage, and you don't often see those on aircraft of, of this period, so I think that's probably the one I'm gonna do. And then the final one is a 19 Squadron aircraft from Operation Dynamo. This is the one that's got the black and white undersides, so that allows some contrast for those of you that are looking for something slightly different. The aftermarket includes 16 trillion different options should you wish to build something a little bit different from this kit. But I think, from my point of view, because this will be done as a, as a full-blown review for, for Model Airplane, that we're going to use what's in the box and I'll go for, for the version that I've that I've stated. I really like that. I'm actually thinking of doing a maybe doing a diorama with this and using some additional figures and, and possibly a vehicle. I don't know. Being pre-World War II I can do something that's a little bit more laid back and but I think a little vignette or something around this might be might be kind of nice. So overall, this is a a very nice release from Tamir. But that almost does it a disservice because all kits that are released by, by them are really nice. I just think in this case it, it's perhaps elevated up in my affections because they've taken the time and, and no considerable expense to release a new version of kit they've already got in, in their range. And I'm struggling to think of another occasion where they've done that. I'm kind of I'm, I'm a bit bit lost on on whether they've ever done that. In fact, no, I don't think they have. So this is somebody will perhaps point out now that that they replaced their prototype F sixteen with a F sixteen C. But given that they're different airplanes, that's probably not the same. But if anybody knows of of one of their kits being replaced and um, in, in this scale, I'd yeah. Zero, there, that might be one. 48 scale zero. I think they replaced a 1970s kit with a with a brand new kit released 10 years ago or so. So there's one, the zero. So I'm really pleased to see to see that happen. Of course, this kit will go head to head with the Airfix Mark I, which is is again very nice, very accurate. So it's another one of those pay your money, take your choice moments, I think. Fans of Tamir will, buy, will lap this thing up. Fans of Airfix will lap up their version. Their version is, is, is cheaper and more readily available, I guess, in, in model shops. But certainly I'm looking forward to seeing what, what this thing's going to be like on my workbench. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes together and how it compares to, to other Spitfires that I've, that I've built over the last, the last couple of years. I'll, at some point, I'll put a pre. I'll, I'll write a preview for this as well, and put a load of photographs up on my up on my blog, so you can see see how that looks. Hopefully, I'll do that sometime today and get that get that out of the way, and then I can forget about this and do the preview for work. So you'll be able to see a little bit more of of this of this thing. So, okay, doke. To me, it's Mark One Spitfire. Very very nice. Yes, it's always a pleasure getting it to me. I think getting a new one and getting, getting your hands on, on these. I know how excited the guys were when they got white box versions of these a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago and, and I know a bunch of people who've built this up now who've really loved the, the, the process and, and having seen Drew's model on the finished on the stand, it looks great. It really does look great. So yeah, perfect. Okay, I think that that's pretty much it for, for this little video. Hopefully you've enjoyed uh, um, hearing about the show and, and, and seeing this, this kit. And hopefully it won't be much longer before I do another one of these. If anything else comes in, I'll, 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 I'll drop it on, on, on here. Thanks once again for the support. Thanks once again for looking out um, for me. And, and um, yeah, just take, generally taking an interest. I think that's, that's, that's a really cool part of this job, to be honest. So thank you very much for that. And I hope you have a great day. Don't forget to check out my blog. If you are interested in the book, please please get in touch with me. Just drop me a message and I'll and I'll get back to you. There's an email address on there, so if you if you want to do that, please do. And um, in the meantime, have a very nice day, have a nice week, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers, bye.